brutally long periods of time. Brutally long periods of time. And they come out, they've done their sentence, they paid their dues, they paid for the crime, but they're still behind bars. Because in this country, if you're labeled a felon, I dislike the word felon. If you're labeled a felon, you can't find a job because you've been in prison. You can't find a place to live because you've been in prison. There's so many educational opportunities closed to you because you've been in prison. You can't vote in too many places because you've been in prison. People disenfranchised for life because they've been in prison. We set people up to fail, and then we wonder what they do. I knew that he was going back. I knew that she was going back. Well, of course, he couldn't find a job. And not only that, there are too many people who are in prison right now, not for what they did that was wrong, but because they broke some rule of parole or probation. You missed a curfew, you're going back to prison. You missed an appointment, you're going back. You didn't pay a fine, you're going back. I didn't find a job. Hmm. How am I to pay the fines? You're going back. Right. And so we set up this caste system, this racial caste system. And you won't hear about it in the private uh -uh. <laughs> You won't hear new papers talking about it unless he's talking about right on crime and that's all about money. You won't hear Mitt Romney talking about it. You won't hear the 1% talking about it. You know, people are saying they don't talk about it because they're colorblind. Yeah. Yeah. They're colorblind. And they act like that's a good thing. Please don't be blind to who I am. They say that they're colorblind and they move beyond race because First Lady Michelle Obama and her children can take a vacation. Didn't all of the first ladies say vacations? I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> they say that they're colorblind and it doesn't matter anymore that we talk about race because Oprah Winfrey has her own television network. One African American woman has her own television network. So we got past it and they say that we don't have to talk about race because Jay Z and Beyonce have all that money, they can rent a whole wing of a hospital to have little Blue Ivy. And I'm so glad Blue Ivy is rich because with a name like Blue Ivy. <laughs> all right. You better be rich. So they say that they won't talk about race in the context of this mass incarceration. And all the while that we're fixated on little Blue Ivy, <laughs> we're fixated on Little Blue Ivy and we're fixated on Oprah, but a little boy, a little girl right up the street, daddy has been gone forever. In prison. And now mommy might be gone too. And aunt and uncle and cousin, they're gone. They're gone. The village that we talk about raising our children, gone, suck right into the criminal justice system. Lord. And you know what, Nana and Papa might be gone too. It has no respect of age or color or person if you are of color, right. if you are African American, Latino, if you're a poor white person. Don't feel like you're gonna get away from mass incarceration if you're a poor white person. Right. All of us should be afraid for our children, native people, locked up. We are truly living in a 99er world. I think mass incarceration represents truly the 99. And it's been called the new Jim Crow. Now, I presentation when our friend Dr. Vincent Hardy brought her to Denver. And I listened as she talked about the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration in an age of colorblindness. 
But to me, the new Jim Crow looks a lot like the old Jim Crow that my big mama used to talk about. The new Jim Crow looks just like the old Jim Crow. Can't vote. That's just the old Jim Crow. Can't get an education. That's just the old Jim Crow. Can't serve on a jury. That's just the old Jim Crow. Can't find housing. Can't get an education. Pushed to the back of the bus. Not just to the back of the bus. Now back to the back of the prison bus. The dream of racial equality that we talk about when we come together each year. Where is it? Now, let's be think here in Colorado, the city beautiful, that this is all about what's happening somewhere else. Colorado Springs, this is our city beautiful. It's not Chicago, it's not Detroit, it's not Atlanta, it's not LA. But let me tell you this this same thing is happening right here, right here in our own backyard. Incarceration rate is 4% higher than the national average. We're talking about Colorado. 4% higher than the national average and it's higher than any other Western state. In Colorado, one in 29 adults is under correctional control, jail, prison, probation, parole. More than 23,000 people in Colorado are in state prisons. 23,000 people. Now let me break it down for you even more because some of you look like maybe you're really not grasping. <laughs> Latinos account for 17% of the Colorado population, but account for 31% of the prison population. African Americans account for 3.8% of the state population, not even 4%. Yeah. That's why when they bump into you somewhere else, they say, well, you know there were black people in Colorado? <laughs> because they're so few. 4% of the state population, but 19% of those who are in prison. 4% versus 19%. In 2008, 21% of the people who were in prison were diagnosed with serious mental illness. Yeah, we locked them up anyway. We locked them up and we put them in solitary confinement. And we threw away the key. Attention, Colorado, it is time for us to take a stand. Now, I'm so happy to be working for the ACLU of Colorado. And because, yeah! ACLU of Colorado, because of the legislation that we pushed last year, despite the fact that they stripped it in the legislature, we still got a solitary confinement bill through that has worked. In 2010, before we introduced the legislation, there were 1,500 people in solitary confinement in Colorado, and most of them were mentally ill. Today, there are 1,100 people in solitary confinement in Colorado. And most of them are still mentally ill, but that's 400 fewer than were there before. For that, I wish you applause. <laughs> I think we not only have to applaud, because King's legacy demands that we have to stand up and we have to join together, we have to speak out and we have to do something about it. Right, We're talking about mass incarceration. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was actually jailed, arrested and jailed 17 times yes, in his short 39 year life. 17 times. Coretta Scott King was arrested and jailed 18 times. 18 times in her lifetime. And maybe they thought that by going to jail, they were going to prevent future generations from having to do so. I can't really guess their motives, but I would have to believe that they went because they thought something would change. Yes. Hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed, but it must change. 
You know, Van Jones, our friend Van Jones, who was right here on this campus not long ago, has called King the original occupier. <laughs> the original occupier. And some people call Jesus Christ the original occupier. Yeah. And both of those ideas, to me, made sense. And that's why we come here today. We did not come here to have breakfast. We came here today to make a change. Yeah. We come here today not because we didn't have anywhere else to go and because the Martin Luther King Day white sales don't start until 10 o'clock. <laughs> so we hang out here until the Citadel. We come here today because we spend more money on prisons than we do on education. And for all of our sakes, for the sake of our children and our grandchildren, it has to stop. Yeah. We come here today not because it makes us feel so much better about ourselves and we can tell our friends a lot of that came for us this morning, but for you. But because we can join together with someone else here today who cares about what we care about. We come here today in this great hall and this city that's decided that it doesn't need community centers anymore. And it doesn't need recreation centers. And it doesn't need senior citizen centers. And it doesn't even need a marriage 100 team program. Let's make sure that we keep the marriage 100 teams program in this community. Let's make sure that we keep the program in this vital. It's vital. You can't shut down all the parks so that young people don't have anywhere to go and turn off all the lights and think that nobody is going to be looking because somebody is looking and history is going to tell on us. History is going to tell on us. And just as King said, we'll have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Believe that we're the good people, and that's why we got up so early to come to this breakfast. Those of us who are gathered today will speak out about mass incarceration because it's wrong, and we'll speak out against the solitary confinement of mentally ill people because it's wrong, and we'll speak out against the death penalty because it's wrong and it's costly and it must be abolished in Colorado. It must be abolished in Colorado. sitting on death row in Colorado right now, guess what? All three of them are black. There's something wrong when you look at these beautiful purple mountains majesty All right. and you recognize the ugly that's on the inside. But we can change it. We can flip it inside out. And I think that's what we're doing with this community celebration. We're standing up. Now does anyone remember that we used to have a march also in this community. That we used to have a march in this community. And I want to let you know that my friend and my sister, Linda Lamo of the NAACP Executive Committee, is right now organizing to bring back the march to this community.